Welcome to the Geoeconomics Podcast, a podcast by the Adrianople Group. I'm here with Leslie Kahn from the Space Foundation. Uh, how are you doing today, Leslie? I'm great, and I'm so pleased to be joining you today. Thanks for being with us. We are glad to have you here. So um, we are super excited about the different de developments that are, are happening in the, in the spatial industry. Can you tell us uh, a little bit more about what does the Space Foundation Absolutely. So we are an international organization and we focus on several areas. The number one thing that we really do is we educate and advocate about the global space ecosystem. So in addition to having experts who are available to discuss and promote the space industry and the, the larger space ecosystem, we also have educators who develop curriculum programming and they share that with students around the world. We advocate for business startups and we help connect them and educate them about the space industry. Uh, we also are continually working to develop a workforce that will be skilled in STEM areas so that they can help grow the space industry. One of the other things that we do is we publish the space report. And as head of the research and analysis team, I guide the information that goes into that. So we provide a quarterly journal that provides updates about everything from the economy to investment to the launch industry to employment trends. We also have, in addition to that publication, we have a website thespacereport.org that allows people to get a lot of up-to-date information and research. Awesome, awesome. Yes, I've seen a few articles uh, from the Space Report. I really like them. All right. In terms of the current trends in the spatial industry, um, what are some of your, uh, what would you highlight in terms of what is your take on, on what is going on in there? For someone who is an outsider of the spatial industry, what would you say is like the main trend going on right now and what we could expect in, in the future of, of it? Well, it is a completely fascinating and exciting time in space right now. We owe so much already to the space industry, the cell phones that we use, the map guidance systems that we use, a lot of medical and pharmaceutical research. That's all grown out of the space industry just in the last couple of decades. But we're right on a tipping point where I think you're really going to see just a mushrooming of possibilities. So some of the things that are happening, you know, obviously people are excited about space tourism and, you know, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. But I think on a larger and even more meaningful scale, you're going to see things such as a really expansive growth in Constellation satellites, what's happening there. So, you know, you, you may soon be able to use your cell phone to access the internet via small satellites. There's so much that's going to be happening in terms of robotics. There's also a lot happening in terms of what will be happening on the moon, exploration of the moon, mining of the moon, space stations that are based near the moon. All of that is kind of directed toward a building economy. There's a real promise and anticipation that The moon not only is mineral rich, but it's also rich in ice. That ice, that water can be used not only to sustain life on the moon, but it also could be used as a propellant to guide us into even deeper space exploration. That's really just a few of the big things happening. Um, asteroid mining is also being discussed. Um, and we're also looking at, again, what you've seen just in the last few months from Mars from the rover and orbiter missions there. That's also another area of tremendous growth. Extraordinary, yes. Something that I, I, I found really interesting is, is how the moon uh, will probably develop in the coming decades. On that point, what do you think is the future of the space jobs? Like, what do you foresee that the next uh, generations will, will have to deal with in, in terms of jobs opportunities in that field, you know? 
Mm -hmm. And it's it's such an an incredibly wide array of possibilities. Um, Again, that's part of the promise of what this holds. And some of the biggest things in the immediate future, um, obviously there are systems engineers that are needed. There are mechanical engineers and even more traditionally considered, you know, blue collar type of jobs. We need people who are skilled at manufacturing the satellites and the launchers that will go into space. Once we get into space, though, there's so much emerging technology in robotics and in nanotechnology. One of the big things that we're seeing right now that that I think you'll be getting a lot of news in the coming months really has to do with robotics and automated manufacturing in space. So one of the big projects you'll be hearing about is a satellite equipped with a 3D printer that will deploy that printer and build its own solar array in space. So these are the more complex jobs that are holding promise. Um, Another major area, though, here on Earth, so much data is being gathered from satellites in space that there's a real need for data analysts. So I think that's just a a glimpse really at all of the opportunities or or actually some of the opportunities that are awaiting in the space ecosystem. So we could definitely say that it will not be only physicists and engineers, uh, but a whole supply chain that is to be set up for the spatial industry. Yes. In fact, one of the interesting things we found last year is that Even people who help those employees are finding jobs. SpaceX recently was advertising for baristas because, as every good scientist knows, sometimes you need a lot of caffeine to fuel your dreams. Totally. That's something I totally agree on. (laughs) I'm (laughs) actually having a cup of coffee while we record this. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So in in terms of Uh, Going a bit uh, deeper into the the, uh, space jobs of the future, Mm -hmm. what do you see on the uh, commercial tourism side, on the spatial tourism? Well, you know, that's another area where you have to think three and four steps beyond what is happening immediately. So obviously right now it's still in the development stage of, you know, getting the launches to happen having those launches happen with regularity, ensuring that there is safety and consistency. I think once you see that, that's when you'll really see a blossoming effect. You'll need people who can coordinate the the scheduling of those events. You'll need um, people who can provide the equipment, the spacesuits that will um, be provided for those who go into space. Once we get past that initial, you know, being in low Earth orbit or, you know, just getting outside of Earth's atmosphere, there are already discussions about space hotels. And so you'll need people to staff those hotels. You'll need chefs who know how to cook in that environment. Um, It's just any number of, of career possibilities. Yes, something that I, I've seen uh, different people from the industry and, and some futurists talk about is uh, they, they tend to do this analogy of how the, the spatial industry is uh, developing in a way that cruise ships, for example, were developing 150 years ago or something like that. And that at some point they were just, uh, uh, they were very expensive and uh, like not everyone were like able to buy a ticket for a cruise ship, for for example. But with time and with the development of the technologies, the uh, the price will immediately go down and it will be more affordable. Yes, that is something that we are already seeing in the launch industry as costs have declined dramatically. That makes space more accessible for everyone around the globe. Extraordinary, yes. Um, talking about um, the launch industry, which is um, a key part of this whole operation, what do you think makes a uh, spaceport economically viable? And how the new different companies like Virgin Galactic or SpaceX and the other different uh, operators of this industry are like innovating and making those prices more affordable? 
Well, I think that touches on several different areas. So let's maybe talk about spaceports first. Um, And we are seeing a growth of the spaceports internationally. One of the reasons for that is just trying to anticipate the demand of greater launch interests. So as you have more and more countries getting interested in going into space, again, because space is becoming more economical, it's easier to develop these payloads. So that will drive up your demand to launch and put your own spacecraft into orbit. So that's kind of the background driver of the interest in spaceports. As you look at those spaceports and from a business decision, one of the things that you have to evaluate is just the the cost of bringing your spacecraft, your payload to launch. So some of the things that have to be considered is the first, just the location from a standpoint of what acreage is available, what is the airspace, you know, is there protected airspace around where you'd like to have your spaceport? Um, What is the population density? You also have to, really a key factor you have to look at is the location in terms of what does it cost fuel-wise to get your payload into space. So that's why you'll see evaluations on whether you locate near the equator so that you can launch space that way or closer to um, a polar orbit. So those are some of the factors you have to evaluate. You also have to consider, interestingly enough, um, weather systems. You know, you may have a great location, but if you know that's an area prone to thunderstorms and lightning strikes, you may have to reevaluate that. And then there's also the logistical support that has to be considered. So those are all factors that kind of tie into spaceport development and the growth, kind of the the behind the scenes driver of why you're seeing more interest in that. So it's not only like the old business sayings goes, location, location, location. There's also other factors that apply to the spatial industry. There are, but I think it's probably still a truism that location, 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 because that will drive so much of the related costs. I see. What would you uh, say, uh, for example, is the role of the venture capital in the spatial industry? Well, as we are seeing, they are playing an increasingly important role. Um, Venture capital investment allows really a a latitude and um, a broadening of who's involved in space industry in the development of new ideas. It also provides money that maybe isn't tied as much to traditional regulatory and governmental oversight. One of the things we're seeing just in the last year is a massive influx of cash investment. What we know typically, again, this saying is true, space is hard. It's a lot of science. It's a lot of technical capability. That tends to be expensive, and it tends to have um, long development costs. The venture capital money is so important because those industries that do show promise, they need the capital to invest. So without venture capital, I'm not sure we would have seen some of the more interesting advancements we've seen in the last few years. Yeah, definitely. They, they play a key role on fueling many of, of these different projects and operations. There's uh, a lot of talk as well, on, on and, and there's also people who criticize, uh, or at least are criticizing the space industry in for things like space debris. Um, what would you say to those people, and what are some solutions that you see in the, in the future? Well, I think that is an interesting point. There are a lot new discussions happening increasingly because of the amount of debris that we are beginning to see. So the more that we want to get into space, the more we want to create um, low Earth orbit constellations, mega constellations, the more we need to make sure that we have an uncluttered environment to do that. What is beginning to happen, I think you'll see, is that it's, it's moving beyond 
just the policy paper discussion arena and moving into an actual engagement phase. Uh, Astroscale has has just put out their their first vehicle, for lack of a better word, that will be deployed and will attempt uh, a first cleanup of space debris. So there is a recognition that this needs to improve. The, the risk, of course, is that if you have larger pieces of debris, especially colliding with active systems, it can knock those systems offline, but also create a cascade effect that could have a tremendous effect on earthbound daily business operations. I see. So yes, it's in in terms of uh, the the debris. It's it's something that there will be more solutions coming on with with time. Is any uh, particular solution that you see viable to be able to deploy in the next uh, five to ten years, or is that too quick for this developing industry? No, I, I think you will see some advancement within five to ten years. And, you know, another interesting opportunity there is space debris tracking. So just in the last couple of weeks, um, there's a business startup that has gotten a contract to do an even more detailed space monitoring than is available now. And that's one of several companies that are operating now as they can track the debris that it then sets up an alert system so that companies or governments or agencies that have active space assets can be alerted to the risk and can adjust and maneuver their assets in anticipation of a collision. There have been a couple high profile episodes already of that where maneuvering had to happen. And I think as you see more sophisticated tracking and more efforts to develop equipment and processes to remove that debris, you'll see some advancements occurring. Extraordinary. That's that's really extraordinary. Um, there's there's discussions and like the the idea is floating around from actually uh, a long time ago. Um, in terms of uh, terraforming Mars and the ability of the humanity of going out to another planet and setting up base in there, um, setting maybe uh, mining operations of some sort. How, uh, not necessarily feasible, because I think already it's, it's pretty feasible, but um, in what time frame do you see that happening? That's interesting because as, as much as we are advancing toward that, um, there are so many issues that are are still um, questionable, I guess, or tentative is perhaps a better word. You know, I, I think we're looking at decades, uh, and uh, that's a tentative answer on my part. I acknowledge that there are so many factors that, that play into that. I think interest is certainly still strong, but there are a number of factors that that sort of have to be puzzled out first. I think that's one reason why you might see more interest in developing sort of sustainable communities on the moon first, because that is a good testing ground for what would happen on Mars. I see. So we'll be probably seeing more development uh, focus on the moon. And uh, once uh, we are there, we'll probably be taking the long shot and go to Mars. I think so. I think that's why you're seeing, for example, China and Russia uh, recently announcing a, a cooperative effort to develop a space station and a lunar community. I think that's why Artemis uh, continues to be part of the public discussion. I think that's um, I think that's really the the near term proving ground. All right, and more on a closing note. Um, what would you say to the younger generations, maybe uh, the, the people who are young and who might listen to this podcast, who 
have dreams of having a job in the spatial industry or do developing their careers in there, what would you say to them? I think the first thing to say is hooray for you. Absolutely keep dreaming. That's how we achieve so much. But as you do that, keep learning. Um, go to our Space Foundation website. Go to the Discovery website. It's available, you know, internationally. There's so much to learn and see and do there. And just look for every opportunity to explore, whether it's online or in person at, at museums. Talk to people who are interested in space. Know the value of STEM education, but also don't be intimidated by that. You know, maybe you don't right away have the strongest math skills, but keep at it. Maybe science is your forte, but just know that the promise of space is out there and there is a place for you in it. Awesome. Extraordinary. All right. Leslie, I'm super glad to have you here as a guest in the Geoeconomics podcast. Thanks a ton for being with us. And I hope we can have you in another edition in the future. Oh, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was a lot of fun. And uh, look for more on thespacereport.org. Definitely. Let's keep in touch. 